what's the best job I can do right now in this situation with this set of data that will give me some insights to generate some kind of competitive advantage. Welcome to the Your Data Driven Podcast. If you like this podcast, be sure to visit our website at yourdatadriven.com for more useful help and advice on setting up your race car, mastering data analysis, and driving faster. Welcome to episode 38. Today, I'm welcoming F1 suspension guru, Richard Firth, to the show. Despite originally looking at aerospace, Richard was recruited to join the Jordan Formula One team by Mike Gascoigne, fell in love with motorsports, and has never looked back. This is part one of a two-part show. In this part, you'll learn about how Richard got into Formula One, about getting the most from a relatively under-resourced budget, how to approach your setup and your testing. He also reveals where you can find the most lap time on any track. Be sure to look out for part two soon, but without further ado, grab a pen, grab a coffee, sit back, and let's enjoy what Richard has to say. You may know that at the end of season one, I wrote the Motorsports Playbook, a summary distilling the first 20 shows into nuggets of wisdom. I made the notes so that you don't have to. If you've not got it yet, go and grab yourself a copy from the website. Welcome, Richard. Thanks for having me, uh, Samir. Great to be here. Look, it's not very often you get you know, the chance to speak to an engineer with your background, and we will find out more about your background in a minute, I'm sure. The challenge for you for the show is to try and you know, help the audience get one or two takeaways from your work as a professional engineer in motorsports and be able to pull that back into their own motorsports, be that uh, club racing, amateur racing, autocross, track day driving, all these kind of things that people do at a sub-professional motorsports level, but where we're always trying to improve. And uh, we had a bit of a pre-chat beforehand about some of the stuff around suspensions and things like that, which is our background, and some of the things that are maybe paddock folklore and things like that, that we could maybe help people un- understand a bit better. So things about setup, suspension, and driving. So how does that sound to you? Sure, yeah, that's, that sounds really good. I think it's going to be an interesting chat. Well, wonderful. Let's, okay, let's have a bit, a bit of a background on you, and then we'll, we'll get into some of these bits and pieces. Yeah, sure. So my background in F1, it, it was almost a little bit by chance. So I had more of an aerospace background. So um, I did aerospace engineering at Kingston Uni, which had a, a fairly strong connection in the past with British aerospace. And I was interested in in all of that area. I mean, I, I was mad about planes as, as a kid. I was forever taking things apart and not being able to put them back together. And I had a slightly destructive streak as well. So I was kind of blowing things up. And, and you know, it's, it's actually quite fortunate that I've still got fingers and eyes, I think. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but I, 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 I wasn't sure exactly what, what I wanted to do. I think I wanted to be an airline pilot for a long time and, and, and kind of led me down the aerospace route a little bit. But when, when I graduated, I ended up working for a simulation company in the field of servo, servo hydraulic test and simulation. And they were doing the seven post rigs for, for F1 teams. Just for everyone's benefit, what's what's a seven post rig? Yeah, so a seven post rig, it's a, effectively a um, ride simulation rig. So these test rigs, I mean, you may have, some of your listeners may have heard of a four post rig where you have four wheel pans and they essentially input the, the road surface profile into your into your full vehicle. So you put the car on the rig. They have them at places like Cranfield Uni and Multimatics have one. And a sim post rig is kind of a, a step on from that, and it's got it's got aero loaders so that you can simulate downforce on the, on on the car. And the, and these were fairly sort of new technology in the in the late nineties, and and were gathering momentum as a setup tool in 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 F one. And I ended up through this company going to to Williams to calibrate their rig. So this was nineteen ninety seven, and I find myself in the pit underneath. Jacques Villeneuve's race-winning car. Before it got hit by the red car. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and the engineers at Williams were demonstrating the rig and they, and they were talking about, they were saying, oh, we're coming up the hill at Monaco now. We're coming up to Casino Corner at the top of the hill. And there's actually a, a manhole cover in the middle of the road. And you'll, and, and you'll see the car jump over this manhole cover. And, and I was just absolutely blown away by the way that they could simulate within tenths of millimeters every bump in the road. And I thought, wow, this is this Formula One stuff is is really, really fascinating. And I was really impressed by the um the attention to detail of the engineers. You know, they they really I'd never had a customer that wanted the calibration done so accurately. And they really wanted to know every detail of how we were doing it. So well, there's something more to this. And I, I ended up doing some work at Jordan as well. After that, one day I decided to call around the teams and see if there are any jobs. And I called Jordan and uh, it was quite funny. They said, um, oh, you must be talking about the job advert for an R&D engineer in autosport. And I didn't actually know what autosport was. So I just kind of, <laughs> I just kind of fronted it out. And I said, yeah, yeah, that's, that's right. Yeah, 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 that one. And uh, they said, well, come in for a chat. So it was with the manager of that department, the R&D department, and, and Mike Gascoigne, who is quite well known in, in F1, and was quite well known as a technical director. Although not to you, probably, at the time. <laughs> yeah, not to me at the time. But it, yeah, he said, well, you're kind of getting in the back door a bit, but I'm, I must have managed to say something in the interview that convinced him. And I think the reality was they realised, because I... Uh, I was able to fault find and maintain these rigs that they could save a load of money by hiring me, uh, save a load of money on call outs. So, so I started <laughs> in that role at Jordan as kind of the, the most junior engineer you could possibly be in the R&D department. And, uh, uh, and, and then, you know, it was kind of down the rabbit hole from then on because I had exposure to, to this whole, whole new fascinating world and, and some really interesting and driven people you know the race engineers people like Dino Toso Sam Michael Bob Bell uh, was one of my managers there and and it was just it you know it was just a huge learning process for me and I I spent five years working with the seven poster which was great because in those days we we had a car permanently on the rig so I really got to understand suspension really well and I also then got into the mathematical modeling and the simulation side no, you'll play it down. It's too humble, but you play it down a little bit. You must have had some aptitude for for this kind of stuff. Although Formula One cars are a little bit like aeroplanes on the ground, aren't they? So you know your aerospace interest is is, is still ticked, as it were. It's just probably a little bit harder. Yeah, well, I think my job it was quite a good sort of learning ground because I I had to be really multidisciplined on that. I had to do a bit of software, a bit of electronics, a bit of mechanical engineering. So that was, I was a bit of an all, all rounder. And then once I got into, into Formula One, it was just really steep. I mean, I was embarrassingly uh, naive <laughs> at first, you know, <laughs> you know, they say things to me like, uh, oh, it's there on the end of the push rod. And I, I'd be like, what, what's a push rod? Yeah. So it, it really was from first base onwards. And, you know, it was, it was a great time to be in Jordan because, I mean, there were only 150 people in, in the team, which for an F1 team now is, you know, it's like, a, a, you know, a, it's a fraction. Now, of, it? Yeah, yeah. So that was really good. And, and I, I eventually ended up being the head of vehicle dynamics at Jordan. And then eventually, as it went through its various guises, uh, you know, Jordan, Midland, Spiker, and then Force India, and we had an injection of cash. And then I, I was eventually head of vehicle science at Force India. And then, so all the time learning, you know, bit by bit. I think I've always been, you know, someone who has kind of embraced continual learning, you know. So I, I, I was never a real shooting star, but I've always, you know, I've always consistently learned and i think that's kind of a theme in in, in my career so far i think well, i think also that um translates to our audience listening as well which is something that i go on about implicitly and uh and and not so implicitly all the time it's about the big lesson from professional motorsports is is the learning and doing something with the resources that you've got in that and then your team 
has always like relatively been underfunded relative to others. So you've always kind of outperformed your budget. And that just thinks that's that's comes down to process and mindset and people and prioritizing stuff, I suppose. Yeah, exactly. And, and Jordan was interesting because it was a real can do kind of underdog team. And I think it's still it's still kind of maintained that character right through to the Aston Martin days today. But yeah, I mean we were we we had some really innovative projects that I was involved in. I mean we did the first kind of spindle coupled seven poster in f1 which had a i mean this is going a little bit probably too technical but it had like an, <laughs> an inverse tire model instead of using real tires and 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 there was some there were a lot of control and mechanical challenges with that and you know i was fortunate to have some very talented colleagues working with me on that and we did things like an active damper project so there were all these you know a little bit blue sky type projects and it was great to have that range in a way that it's difficult nowadays for graduates coming into Formula One to get involved in such a range of things as it as it was at the time. So yeah, eventually I, I, I came out of Force India. I, I, I had a, a call from James Key who'd gone over to Sauber and I went over there as head of vertical dynamics, which, which sounds very specific, but curiously at Sauber, it's quite, it's a reasonably big job because it also included things like full-size wind tunnel testing, the car build for that. So I was out there for a couple of years and and then I I wanted to come back to the UK because my kids were in the UK and I, I spoke to Pat Simmons, who was a um, consultant for Mauritia at the time, post his little ban from F1. He invited me to set up a vehicle performance group at Mauritia. I did that. Uh, that was a really good challenge just to build a group from scratch. The first 75% of my working life in F1 was with kind of underfunded teams. So it was really, you know, you had to make do with what you had and really seize those opportunities, whereas the bigger teams, would they could afford to take five different directions and choose the best one. We were talking about, I was talking about that just the other day, actually. So what is it, what would you do with this extra budget? And and it is that, isn't it? It's, it's, it's it, you can just with more depth, pursue more ideas in parallel than you would be able to do with a lower budget. And it's, so that's interesting. So it's not necessarily coming up with more ideas. It's being able to pursue those and, and the challenge that, that you've had. And, and the challenge that we as an amateur racers have is that we've only got a certain amount of time or budget to pursue improving. You know, how do we prioritize what's the best thing to do? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's exactly it. I mean, money gives teams range and depth i would say but it can also lead to a certain complacency and it was interesting when we first went into mclaren as customers at force india and and i was leading a, a simulated program for force india and um, we expected mclaren to have some amazing tools and they did in some ways but in other ways we realized that the tool set that we'd developed as a small team was a lot more agile and because we were used to having a different technical director every year and you know different owners and having one shot to get the car right we we actually had quite quite a, an agile approach to the tool development and some and some really good tools and I remember we we did validated a quick shift gearbox fully in multi-body simulation, which you'll, you'll, you'll know a lot about yourself having having had had background in that stuff. And yeah, so it was it was interesting going into McLaren and then coming back to Mauritius. So I was I, I did that for eighteen months and then got a call from from McLaren, and that was kind of the culmination of a, you know sort of a long-term ambition to work for one of the top teams. So, although you know. The period 2014 to 2019 it was, was actually quite quite a difficult period for McLaren. But yeah, so I, I started there and I was responsible for the um, simulator team delivery to, to race support and also the team in mission control doing the vehicle performance support. Uh, also the, the suspension analysis side of stuff. So a lot of stuff that was very familiar to me from other jobs. But I mean, McLaren, again, was another big step in the learning. You know, there's a, there was a lot of talent in there. There were a lot of interesting approaches. And we also had some some turnover of the culture in there while I was there. So it was kind of, there was, you know, a sort of old guard moving out and new guard coming in. And there were a lot of bumps in the road and a lot, lot of conflict and different drivers coming in with Fernando Alonso, <laughs> etc. So, yeah, it was a really interesting time. But, I mean, the, the learning opportunity from that was really big. How do you take your direction? Like, so, so, so this, is, this is something that's 
for me, it's non-obvious, but when you think about it, uh, you know, it becomes more obvious. But it's, it's, I suppose it's the balance between that engineering utopia, yeah, the ideal car setup and suspension will be X, and then you've got the driver, you know, and then and then manage and managing those two, which you know, so you're trying to get the most out of both your engineering and your driver. How much priority do you give to the driver, and how much do you give to the wind tunnel guy or whatever? You know. I think this is where it really gets fascinating in terms of most sport engineering is that that human interface. The driver is an incredible controller. And I can remember going to winter tests in Jerez and, you know, the driver who hadn't done all the kind of the initial shakedown work, the driver who sort of stepped in halfway through the test after not driving a car for two months on a kind of semi-frosty January morning in Hereth would, within a lap and a half, be pretty much on the limit. And, you know, my jaw just hanging open, thinking, how did they do that? And, and you really, it really gives you a good appreciation of what an amazing controller the human brain and the human body is, especially as well when you, when you get into the simulation world and, and you're used to the data analysis, and you realise that even with a lot of sensors on the car, things like, the actual your moment balance of, a, of the car on the limit is actually pretty tricky to, to actually measure that because you're within a few newton meters of about, is the difference between understeer and oversteer. And the driver will see that as a very, very distinct. But if you try to see it in the data, you know, you can have your usual metrics, you know, based on steering slip angles, of course, but actually measuring in kind of deterministic numbers is, 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 is always a challenge. Well, that gives us hope for all of us who are looking at data, you know, <laughs> in a field or something, or in a, you know, under a, under a tent. You know, that, that that even even you know at the very top level, there's, there's still a question mark about it. And and this is something that I try and make a point about as well about the data. It's only that tool. It's um one analogy I use is is uh, having worked a lot in Olympic sports as well, where data is a bit suspicious. You know, it's a bit like, what is this? Is this trying to get rid of my job? Is this, what is, what is this thing doing? And I, my perspective was like, well, there's, imagine we're, there's three or four of us sitting around the table and we're trying to make a decision about what to do, like something. Um, for me, data was always just that and just one more chair at the table with an opinion, an opinion that wasn't based on influenced by bias necessarily. Obviously. Engineer, you can, you can you can put bias in your numbers, but the point the point being the, the idea is that it was non emotional, a, a non emotional opinion that could contribute to that dis- discussion, but it was still a human decision that was made at the end of the day. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for me, it's about looking at the information, the data, the sensors you actually have access to, and saying, you know, what's the best job I can do right now in this situation with this set of data that will give me some insights to generate some kind of competitive advantage and if you don't have that base data even you can go out and test and generate it at one end of the scale you know you've got kind of in in top level motorsport that could be like a fusion of sensors where you're using things like Coleman filters state space estimators to infer signals that you don't have explicitly from sensors but the other end of the scale you know you could be with your your club racing car or your or your track day car just literally feeling the changing grip and balance of your car as you set yourself up to do some simple tests, you know, design some simple experiments, you know, try and remove some of the variabilities to try and identify which direction you're getting. Yeah. So can you give us an example of like, say, say you, are, you and I went on a, I don't know, track day or something, and then we took, you took a race car, you had some adjustability on it. It's like, what, you know, what would you do? I mean, so would you do some kind of baseline thing or? Is there a process you would follow that you would think, okay, this is going to, if we approach the day in this way, that's going to give me more reliable results than another way? Or Yeah, I mean, I guess I've never actually done any of that myself. But I mean, the way I would approach it is I'd look at how much of the variable factors can, can I eliminate? You know, so, you know, do I really need to be doing, you know, a full lap of, the national circuit or whatever to get some direction from this car could i put some cones out in the car park and thereby i'm removing one set of variabilities around around the driven line or or you know or the conditions of the track at the time and then, and then i'd look at really at the the fundamentals you know say okay well where do the 
the real performance limitations lie in this in this vehicle you know often it's it's fundamentally things like the tires you know so can we design an experiment around tire pressures you know so you've got a a lot of different trade-offs going with 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 your tire pressures you know are, are you in the the working window of the the compound or is it about optimizing the the area of the contact patch do you need to recover negative camber with bump due to to the load transfer you know so there are all these things and ultimately you want to be making sure that you've got the most grip out of the tires at any given point so I'd, I'd start to think about okay what are the most basic tests that i can do that are eliminating as much noise as possible in the result that i can get there's lots of things that you could do with the balance of the car and set up weight distribution anti-roll bars etc but i think it'd be probably too specific for me to to suggest anything on that i'd be more looking more for an approach of okay where do the fundamental performance limitations lie in this vehicle and and how can i devise some simple test to try and explore what those are without confusing myself so everything resolves to the tires of course in any vehicle and therefore to get on top of those is really the first port of call i would i would suggest i mean in terms of process the thing that i've heard done quite a lot is this sort of ab testing or aba testing or a b c d a testing i.e you go back to an original you start you, you do something with a setting do something else and then go back to the original one well yeah exactly i mean this is this is coming back to what i was saying about trying to remove the variability in your test or or put some kind of control into your test so you're going back to the baseline and then by comparing those baselines you can see you know whether the track has evolved whether your tire temperatures have actually changed during the course of the test and therefore you're in a different window of the way that the tire generates its grip so yeah i mean an aba is 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 the very least of what what you should do or an abc a there are variations on it but i don't think there's any kind of magic bullet as to how you approach it it's just kind of that mindset as to can i understand as simply as possible draw some simple conclusions from what i'm trying to do here i mean in 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 f1 we use models to predict the magnitude and the direction of let's say performance objectives to parameter changes so is the car getting quicker if i do these changes to the setup well there's a bit of a misconception that you always need a really accurate model of the vehicle in every way and that's simply not it's not true I mean, there's a saying that the only true model of a cat is another or preferably the same cat. And what that means is that by definition, no model is ever completely correct. You know, and also, you know, that, I mean, we, we kind of say, well, all models are wrong, but some of them are useful. And, and, you know, it's kind of that acceptance that models are horses for courses. You don't need a complex model. You just have to make sure that you're aware of what you own and that you understand what that model can give to you with confidence you know there's no point having a super accurate model but then having a lot of uncertainty about say like a super accurate vehicle model and having a lot of uncertainty about your tire model because ultimately it's going to undermine uh, having that great vehicle model so yeah i think you know it's about working with what you've got but trying to understand what you own and if if that comes through going out and doing some simple tests that's great. If you've got some sensors, then make the best use of those sensors that you can. Yeah, it's fascinating. I've used that cat analogy. I don't know if I've, I've ever used it on the podcast. I've, I've definitely used it in a sort of a board meeting with sports people. When I was trying to, trying to get across the point, this really awkward point of, yes, we need to do some prediction and simulation. And yet that prediction and simulation is not going to give us the explicit answer that you want. And they're like, what's the point? <laughs> and it's like, well, it's going to help reduce that uncertainty and give us a direction that hopefully is more accurate. And what the sports are really good at doing is, is starting with an, out, an outcome and working backwards from that, um, from a mindset point of view. So what does success look like? And in this context, I think success would look like a prediction. So if you're, you're about to start your event, it could be a, a test session, it could be a qualify in a race or whatever you're about to start your event and you have with the, the the things that you can control and change on the suspension or 
in your head as a driver. We'll get onto that in a bit. You've set those things with a, a level of predictive confidence that it's going to be the best you can do. And then with, but equally with an open mind such that no matter what happens, we'll learn from this as well and keep on improving. And so if you go back to like, well, what can I do to give myself more confidence that I've got the right springs on or I've got the right tire temperatures, uh, pressures, or I've got the, the right camber settings and the right toe settings, what can I do before that in preparation, before that event to give me confidence that in that situation, I'm going to have predictably the best kind of setup I can. And hopefully that's better than my competitor. Yeah. I completely get that. I mean, it's something that I encourage the junior engineers that that work in my team to do is to is to work on having that mental model of of the vehicle in their in their heads, so that they've got you know they've they've done the groundwork, they've looked at the layout of the the suspension, they've done some simple calculations, they understand how everything works, and they they've got this mental mapping of. You know, if I change one step of anti-roll bar, I know what that is in mechanical balance. If I change five millimeters of ride height, I know what that'll do to the aero balance. I know how tire pressure might reasonably change the mechanical balance, for example. Have a little bit of a feel intuitively for what the underlying model of, of the car is, because that will inform your decisions. And I think it's worth investing in that. It is an investment, though. It is an investment. I mean, it may be, you may just make a simple Excel model. You know, you might know your, your spring rates, your, your masses, your damping rates, and just understand, make a simple weight transfer model, you know, understand what the changes to the spring stiffnesses do for, for the mechanical balance, for example, or how they affect the, the static ride height or, you know, all of these kind of things. So it is an investment. I mean, it's not not necessarily for everyone at a, at a club level, but I think if you are able to do that, and I think there are off the shelf tools as well that can help help you with that. Go away and experiment with those off off the shelf tools. Understand, you know, the fundamentals of what you're doing to the vehicle. But I think coming back to your point about all comes from the tires. <laughs> I, 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 absolutely. I mean, I always think from the tire up. You know, ultimately, you've got these four small contact patches, and they are pretty small, <laughs> creating this phenomenal car performance. Well, keeping the car on the road effectively, and and then the rest of the car is a system, you know, orientated around maximizing the potential in those, you know, the contact patch and delivering the power. So, try and understand how a tire works. I think this is really important. Here, you know, any level of motorsport. I think you need to understand about sliding in the contact patch what happens when a contact patch goes into full sliding and you know things like well you know you lose all the pneumatic trail and then your aligning moment goes away and that's why the steering goes light and and what happens when you you know you tr- low transfer laterally and longitudinally why does an anti-roll bar change the balance of the car with re- respect to that so you know, i think once you understand those fundamental concepts it changes your your perception of how you approach getting the most out of the car because you suddenly you start to understand okay well that's what must be going on in the tire so if that's going on in the tire i've already got a kind of idea about the sort of things that might help with that and, and then you've actually got a foothold you know almost like a scientific foothold to start to guide your decisions around how you set the car up i mean if, if you're not from an engineering background i'm sure it it could all sound very daunting, but I think it doesn't have to be super complex in terms of the maths. I mean, it, the, the, there are some really quite fundamental things that can guide that kind of decision making. Yeah, I mean, the tire the tire is just one of those subjects, isn't it? And and so um, not to put you on the spot, but but even at the highest level in motorsport, do we explicitly one hundred percent understand everything about the tire? <laughs> I, I, I probably fairly confidently say no. <laughs> so, so there's a relief there. <laughs> yeah. No, there is a. I mean, there are some super talented engineers working in in that field, and it, it is at you know it's their life's work. That's not an overstatement either. And it, it's a huge field because it it marries chemistry, you know, physics, thermodynamics, structures. You know, so it's, it's such a multidiscipline field, and 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 that's why it's always 
fascinating. I, I think it's one one of my favorite areas within my job is to go into the tire meetings <laughs> because <laughs> because there's always something that you'll learn. There's always something that you learn from that. It's it, it's such a fluid. You've got this time dependent, temperature dependent system, very transient, frequency dependent as well. Frequency dependent. I mean, there's there's a lot going on there, and uh, and anyone who says that they've nailed it down is, um, is is lying. So I recently did a a webinar with a chap called Ross Bentley on on tires for tires for drivers. And in preparation for that, I was doing the slides. I thought, okay, well, I'd, I need to say something of, you know, a value here. But even preparing that, I learned a lot. And I found a video of this guy in, um, I'll put a link, I'll put a link in the, in the show notes for it. But I found a guy uh, in the States who's put a GoPro on the inside of his tire. Yeah? So he's, he's literally just taped it to the, to the wheel inside his tire and driven. Oh, I think I've seen this. Yeah, I think I've seen this. Well, given given what I do like online now, this guy's had 10 million hits. It's only taken, <laughs> only taken him half an hour and he's probably earned more money. Anyway, yeah, <laughs> moving, on, moving on from all of that. Yeah, But yeah, and you just watch it and you go, obviously that's what's happening, but I never thought of, I never thought of it like that because you're traveling with the wheel and you see the rubber moving up and down as it hits the road and it's really vibrating and think, oh, this contact patch isn't this static thing. It's this kind of quite an organic thing that's moving around. And I was just like, wow. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, it's amazing as well, isn't it? That we've had uh, over a hundred years of the pneumatic tire, I think now, and and it hasn't been, it hasn't, well, it's been improved, of course, but I mean, the the fundamental concept has has remained the same. So yeah, it's, 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 uh, absolutely fascinating and it's one of it's one of those areas in motorsport you can guarantee you're not going to stop learning if you if you're involved in it so the, the i suppose the takeaway is focus on the tires but they don't necessarily be too upset if if it gets to a certain point where it gets a bit too deep <laughs> yeah i mean if you know if, if diminishing if, returns i think maybe yeah i mean if you're able to get hold of some fundamental force and moment curve fits and you're able to interpret them you know that's great even even kind of let's say uh slip angle versus versus mu or grip you know and how that how that changes with vertical load you know if you've got that i mean fundamentally that's that's what's driving uh, the balance change of, of, of your car as you as you adjust uh, mechanical balance so um y- you know that's one of the the steps to understanding what's going on with your car but uh, if, if if not, you know, you can take the more experimental route and try to understand what the tyre is wanting. <laughs> but it's, uh, you know, that you, it's a moving target and, uh, you know, it's, it's quite tricky. Where does the driver come into this then? Because when you talk about moving target, it makes me think, oh, actually, different drivers are going to have different effects on the tyre. We, we hear all the time about, oh, this, this driver's really good at looking after their tyres or whatever. Where, where's the driver coming to getting the most out of the kit? Well, that's it for part one. I'm sure you'll agree it's fascinating to get such insight in how F1 teams are solving the exact same problems that we face on track too. I really hope you got a lot out of listening to Richard. Coming up in part two, we address getting great driver feedback, talk about wet setup and how you can use data to inform your understanding of how to go faster on track. It's a really great episode, so I can't wait to have you join me soon. If you like this episode, be sure to subscribe to the podcast and visit us at yourdatadriven.com. Listener.